Chapter One of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter One. The Secretary of War ended his statement. That is all there is to tell, gentlemen, concerning the building of the new transports. I had closed my notebook and was rising, as Ordway, the private secretary, entered. "'May I give the correspondence that freak letter that came in this morning?' he asked. His chief nodded indulgently and left the room. I opened my notebook expectantly. "'This is a very serious matter, and a great piece of news,' Ordway remarked in a mock grandiose manner. "'It is a declaration of war against the civilized world in the interests of peace.' He threw himself into an oratorical posture and began— to the United States of America, and to all other nations, greeting, whereas war has too long devastated the earth, and the time has now come for peace, I, the man destined to stop all war, hereby declare unto you that you shall, each and all, disarm, that your troops shall be disbanded, your navy sunk or turned to peaceful ends, your fortifications dismantled. One year from this date I will allow for disarmament, and no more at the end of that time if no heed has been paid to my injunction i will destroy in rapid succession every battleship in the world by the happenings of the next two months you shall know that my words are the words of truth given under my hand and seal this first of june nineteen something signed the man who will stop all war ordway ceased and a laughing clamor arose how the biggest crank yet where was it mailed i thought you said you had something really good this time do you suppose he sent it to any other country than the united states ordway raised his hand for a hearing and replied to the last question the letter was mailed from london and was sent to other countries i read the missive to one of the english attaches when it came and he looked the matter up this notice has been sent to all the foreign chancelleries as well as the departments of war and of the navy it has been done in such a wholesale fashion that i thought you could use it for a column anyway but is it such a fool idea asked reed one of the older correspondents couldn't a man build a submarine in which he could run amuck and destroy battleship after battleship something as old as jules verne's captain nemo did not to-day said orway emphatically the new armor of the last years with its permanent torpedo nets has stopped all that the only way you can destroy a modern battleship is by ramming or by another battleship the day of the torpedo boat and of the submarine ended almost as it began well said reed argumentatively why couldn't a man have a battleship any one of five hundred men living to-day could afford it no battleship could be built by a private citizen without some nation knowing it and stopping it said ordway seriously it takes months reaching into years to build one it takes skilled naval constructors hundreds of workmen and thousands of tons of material that must be bought in the markets of the world let's see the paper it's written on i said as i held the message reed looked over my shoulder and read for a moment then turning he cried come over here boys and look at this a little more closely that's old parchment just like that of some of those papal bulls in the glass over in the library as he spoke a sudden remembrance flashed across me anybody got a microscope around here i asked quickly there's a reading glass said ordway and opening the drawer he handed one to me I took the paper to the sunlit window and began examining it closely with the lens. The rest watched me curiously. At last I shook my head. No use, I exclaimed. I thought I had a clue, but it didn't pan out. There's a good story, though, without anything more. Here, Ordway. And I handed back the letter. The other correspondents moved away, seeking fresh fields or copy. But I lingered a moment as John King, my classmate at Columbia and my good friend, stepped forward to bid Ordway goodbye. As I watched his deeply lined, melancholy face and his emaciated form, I wondered if wealth had not come to him too late. "'Good-bye, Ordway,' said John. "'This is the last you'll see of me. I'm through with the daily grind at six o'clock tonight.' "'I'm sorry to hear that in one way, King,' said Ordway gravely. "'I felt last year when you went abroad that you were running downhill, and I expected, when I heard you would come into your uncle's money, that you would pull out.' what are you going to do oh i shall travel again for a bit replied john 
there are some things i want to do before i get through with this old earth if i am to get through you'll be all right answered ordway i only wish i had your chance uh, there's my bell now you see how it is tied like a slave to the wheels of the chariot etc but good luck anyway and good-bye he gave john a friendly grasp and as he turned away through the massive folded sheet which he still held into the waste-basket i guess we won't file out with estate documents he said laughing good-bye and good luck once more we parted and john and i started down the corridor we had gone but a few steps when exclaiming there i've left my stick i turned swiftly back recovered the letter from its place in the waste-basket and emerged with my cane silently we walked down the broad avenue until just before we reached my office i turned sharply come in here i said dragging john into a cafe we sat down at one of the small tables you used to do the smithsonian and scientific stories for your paper didn't you i asked john was sitting staring into vacancy he paid no attention to my question and i repeated it twice before he turned nervously with a shake of the head and asked sharply what is it i repeated the question once more yes he said abstractedly well who do you know that owns any radium he thought for a moment and said slowly why the smithsonian people have a little of course and there's some in half a dozen places in the city but from whom could we get some most easily i inquired oh i i know he answered dorothy haldane has some she's here in washington working with part of her brother's radium and she's with her cousin mrs hartnell who's dorothy haldane any relation to tom haldane who was just ahead of us the chap who went into physical laboratory at columbia and who's doing private research now his sister she is bernard a m and his research assistant her regular blue stocking i remarked with some dislike for the learned research woman never appealed to me oh no said john not at all she is one of the prettiest nicest girls i ever knew any feeling about your remarks john i said hopefully of course not he answered with some irritation there'll never be any more feeling since anna's death there can't be well, i know you'll like dorothy though what do you want her radium for there's just a chance that i may have a scoop and if you take me up there to-night i'll let you in i'll take you up there said john but you can have your scoop to yourself for the last word of copy i ever write will be in print before we call that afternoon came an unexpected cabinet change for hours i interviewed and wrote telephoned and telegraphed reaching my room at half after eight to find john just ready to leave without me he had written the story of the man who was to stop all war only to see it killed by more important news his experience had been that of every man in the secretary's office a common fate in the crowding rush of newspaper life i had never seen john more distant than that night and we walked up to the hartnells in utter silence i so completely expected despite john's assurances to find a stooping bespectacled student type inside the hartnells door that the girl who rose as i entered gave me a sudden shock of amazement and delight she was the sunniest daintiest type of american girl you could meet the country through her mobile face was lit with glowing life and interest in the world around her fine firm form showed no trace of scholastic life her laugh was like rippling water her eyes held the fine deep beauty of a summer's night with her was a dark and clear-cut southerner who was introduced to me as richard regnier the talk went hither and thither until john broached my search for radium what is your need of radium mr orrington said miss haldane i hesitated for a moment and john broke in don't be afraid of regnier jim he's no newspaper man he's a reformer like myself we're called members of the tuberculosis league and the civic league and the peace society now what's up you haven't told me yet so urged i told the story of the morning and brought forth the heavy parchment which i had retrieved from the waste-basket gregnier sat immobilized during the whole tale though dorothy broke into it with pointed questions a dozen times that's what i want the radium for i said in ending but what has radium to do with that letter asked john just this i replied as you may have seen i held that letter to the light under a reading glass which acted as a burning glass for some minutes i was looking for invisible ink which could be brought out by heating i didn't find any but as i turned away the paper came for a moment into the shadow and i saw a slight gleam like the glimmer of phosphorescence on water now last year i met an old scientist von myron 
who happened to mention that he had found that certain inks which had been used for parchments in olden times held a substance which becomes phosphorescent when exposed to radium he got a second letter in that way once from beneath a message one of the popes sent to a king of france you see parchment was and is expensive and hard to get they used the same piece over and over again removing the old inks by scraping or dissolving somehow the radium brought out the stuff that had been apparently removed when reed said papal bulls it gave me an idea it is barely possible that the man who wrote the letter might have written something on that piece of parchment before and then erased it i thought i'd try radium on the chance there may be nothing in it but it will do no harm will it miss haldane oh no said miss haldane i have some of my brother's radium right here i'll bring it down and we'll expose the letter to it a moment later she returned this time with her cousin mrs hartnell now we will darken the room she said holding out a small lead case with hinged cover and try this wonder worker but you must not move from your places if you get in the way of the rays you are likely to be badly burned we were grouped in a semicircle before a barred table whereon was placed the open letter in a holder confronted with the leaden casket i was given the place of honour directly in front and miss haldane put her chair beside mine carefully she opened the hinge door in the front of the radium holder stepped to the switch threw off the electric light and came to sit beside me we waited in perfect silence our eyes bent on the blackness before us i could hear her regular breathing i could feel the brush of her skirt as she leaned forward and i forgot all else the noise of the city without the audience within both disappeared from my consciousness there was but a vast rolling ocean of blackness and she and i bound by a swiftly tightening chain were being dragged closer and closer together old von myron's pet saying love pa what is it but an excess of positive electrons in a certain man urging him towards the negative electrons in a certain woman kept ringing in my ears the while i indignantly refuted it again and again it persisted and with it came the thought that the ways from the radium were the chain which bound us i had forgotten the letter utterly when suddenly i heard a slight catch in the regular breathing beside me and a soft warm hand raised swiftly brushed mine for a moment as it was raised the sharp thrill shook me into consciousness i looked before me and there glimmering into light a single curve came from the darkness then a straight line then appeared a large u one by one letters filled out whole words appeared united states first july second and a single capital i next to it word after word appeared half lines filled into sentences i could hear behind me a quick almost sobbing breath that half penetrated my mind but leaning forward close beside was miss haldane at last in a clear low voice she began to read i the man who will stop all war hereby declare that i will destroy one battleship of the united states during the first week of july nineteen something one battleship of england during the second week of july nineteen something one battleship of france during the third week of july nineteen something one battleship of germany during the fourth week of july nineteen something i shall follow that destruction by sinking in regular order one battleship of each of the other great powers may the lord have mercy on the souls of them who suffer for the cause of peace she stopped and we waited watching the glowing signal for what seemed hours for what was minutes no more appeared though the brightness of the words of the second message did not dim at last miss haldane rose and with a quick movement turned on the lights and shut the cover the letter returned to its former appearance i sat blinking regnier still sat immobile john held his face in his hands mrs hartnell sat with closed eyes do you believe it i asked miss haldane quickly she nodded gravely it's what he means to do she said he wrote it that way first and then erased it and made it general afterward i don't believe it said mrs hartnell sharply it's impossible it certainly doesn't seem probable said john at last raising his face regnier alone did not speak for a moment we were silent each busy with the thoughts the message had roused within him at last i rose with an effort good night miss haldane i said i thank you for your help i am very glad you brought the letter to me she said simply i am going back to new york to-morrow so i cannot ask you to call upon me there but if you are in new york won't you come and see me and give me any news you may have of this threatening peril i shall be only too glad to do so i responded my heart bounding i had reached the door when miss haldane called after me 
oh mr orrington would you be willing to let me have the letter i should like to show it to my brother i'll send it to you any time you wish certainly you may have it i replied and i handed her the parchment regnier left the house with john and me we walked in silence to the corner where regnier turned off as we parted he hesitated for a moment you were strangely right in your surmise mr orrington he said slowly i am very glad to have been present at so curious an event queer chap regnier said john musingly as we watched the retreating form clever scientist and good fellow but queer i hope he'll never get dorothy haldane she wouldn't be happy with him my heart sank like lead do you think there's much chance that he will i queried anxiously to tell the truth answered john slowly i don't know we had come by this time to the door of john's hotel i'm not going to ask you up to-night jim he said i'm utterly fagged out and exhausted besides i must get off early in the morning so good-night and good-bye both he paused and i could see the muscles of his face twitching and his hands nervously clasping he went on with a rush don't forget me while i'm gone old man will you remember our commencement night when we walked up riverside and talked of the great future lying before us of all i cared for then not one remains except yourself of all the health and vigor i had then only a shred is left i shall not see you for two years anyway there's nobody left to write to me don't forget me drop me a line occasionally care bearings will you with such an intensity of pleading came the last words that i was shaken despite myself write you i guess i will i cried don't you worry about that we grasped hands and parted end of chapter one Chapter Two of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Two. It's no use, Orrington. There's nothing in it, said the managing editor decisively we can't publish a fairy story like that we got to stick to the probabilities at least what did the secretary of war say when you told him oh he said it was simply the insane freak of a crazy man i answered glumly enough for i had set my whole heart on this scoop and felt more and more convinced that it was true the more i was rebuffed i went on with a gleam of hope i'd like to have you see radium bring out the second letter that was underneath the first my dear chap said the chief a little impatiently i'll take your word for that and you could use that story very well in another way but it isn't news whole fleets can't be sunk by a single man it's nonsense he placed his glasses on his nose with a vigorous gesture and picked up a fresh bunch of copy without a word i passed out into the big office where sitting down at an empty desk by the window i lighted my pipe and lost myself in thought not very pleasant thoughts they were for i had been rebuffed for my enthusiasm on every side since i took up the quixotic task of persuading the united states that one of her battleships was in danger my own chief the washington correspondent the war department the president and now the managing editor of the new york office whither i had been suddenly called all laughed at my tale dorothy haldane alone had believed together we had seen the message grow from the darkness we were convinced of its truth from that one meeting had come the feeling that when dorothy agreed the opinion of the rest of the world faded to minor account over and over again her name threaded the shuttle of my thoughts dorothy was my last thought as i lay down at night dorothy was my first thought with the dawn i had an hour to wait before i could reach a man whom i had been told to interview and i sat back waiting and dreaming it was tuesday of the fatal week the first week in july suddenly the door of the chief's office opened and i heard my name orrington orrington i jumped to my feet and hurried in the chief was sitting with the receiver to his ear close that door he ordered here's orrington now tell him what you told me i took the phone at his gesture and listened orrington yes the man on the other end was the head of our washington office there may be something in that story of yours the war department has just called me up the alaska has disappeared somewhere between newport news and bar harbor they talked with her by wireless yesterday morning and have been unable to get in communication with her since she has two sets of wireless on board and has not been out of close communication for three years they have sent four revenue cutters out searching the coast but nothing has been seen 
Finally, the secretary thought of you and the message from the man who intended to stop all war. Have you found out anything? No. Well, take your orders from New York now. They've asked for you for this. I don't think the other papers have it yet. I straightened up with a throb of joy and turned to the chief. He looked at me keenly. Better not write anything till you have something more. The assignment is yours. Go out and find the Alaska or what happened to her. I give you carte blanche. Hardly were the last words out of his mouth before I had jumped for my hat and was hurrying down the stairs with a generous order for expense money in my hand. A moment's stop at the cashier's and I was out on the street. Up and down I looked for a cab or automobile. I was bound for the waterfront. For once there was not even a street car going my way. I started hurriedly on, half running in my speed. As I rushed along I heard my name. Mr. Orrington! The voice would have called me Miles. It was Dorothy Haldane, seated in a big blue motor. Her chauffeur drew up beside me, and she threw open the door. Let me take you wherever you're going. Tell me if you have heard more from that letter. I needed no second invitation, gave the wharf address to the chauffeur, and turned to answer Dorothy. As I told her the news, she leaned forward to the chauffeur. Go back to where we left Mr. Haldane's launch, she said, and turned to me. I've just left Tom at his launch, which was to take him out to Black Arrow. They were waiting for some provisions at the wharf, and may be there yet. He'll be delighted to take you, and the Black Arrow is one of the swiftest motor yachts in the bay. Will you make your search on her? If you will, I'll go with you. I only stayed ashore today to do some shopping. We can wait. When the gods befriend a man, who is he to say nay? Through the hot and dirty markets we sped, and reached the wharf just as the Black Arrow's launch was leaving the shore. A clear call and a wave of Dorothy's parasol brought it back while a bewildered smile passed over Tom Haldane's face as he saw us awaiting him. "'Why, Jim!' he began. "'Don't stop to talk now,' said Dorothy. "'Take us to the Black Arrow as fast as you can.' In a moment we had cleared the wharves and were passing from the dirt and smells of the city onto the clear waters of the bay. As we went, Dorothy explained the situation to Tom, who fell in with the plan joyously. Once on the slim, rakish yacht, he spoke. "'Now, Jim, you're in command. Where are we going?' right down the coast i said and we'll megaphone every fisherman and yacht it's the men on the coasters who will know if any one does swift as her name the black arrow ploughed her way through the summer sea pleasantest of all assignments to sit on her deck and watch dorothy helding as she talked and speculated on the problem before us could one man have sunk so mighty a battleship was there any possibility that a single man could make war on the world tom came up to us in the midst of the discussion and stood listening "'Queer this should come up now,' he said. "'It was only last winter that someone was talking about something like this up at our house, one Sunday night. "'Who was it, Dorothy?' A sudden look of alarm flashed across her face. She started to speak and then broke off. "'Oh, I hardly remember,' Tom persisted. "'Let's see. There was a crowd of the fellows there, and queer thing too, John King and Dick Regnier, the same pair that were with you the other night.' Regnier? That name shot across me like a bullet. Short, quick, troubled breathing of someone behind me on the night we read the letter. Can it be? I burst forth. Dorothy made no pretense of misunderstanding me. No, she said firmly. Dick was up to see me last night. It couldn't have been he. The coast had been rushing by us rapidly as we talked, and now the summer cottages and bathing beaches were giving way to longer stretches of bare sand and wooded inlets. I rose and looked forward. We may as well commence here, I said, and we began systematic inquiry. Catboat and sloop tacking out on pleasure bent, tramp steamer ploughing heavily up the coast. One after another we came alongside and asked the same questions. Have you seen a battleship today or yesterday? Have you seen or heard anything unusual? The answers came back in every vein. Brusque denials, ironical inquiries, would-be humorous sallies, courteous rejoinders. One and all had the same word. No battleship seen, nothing unusual seen or heard. The morning had become noon ere we were fairly on our quest. The afternoon wore on towards night as it progressed. As the hours passed, I protested against my hosts giving up their yacht to my service, but quite in vain. They were as firmly resolved to pursue the quest to the end as I was myself. At about five o'clock, when we were some six or seven miles off the coast, came the first success— we hailed a schooner whose lookout replied negatively to our questions. As we passed slowly, we heard a sudden hail. As a gaunt man, the skipper rushed to the side. "'Looking for anything unusual, be ya?' he shouted. 
I seen one thing, a cat boat, taken on a crazy man out of a knockabout. Whereabouts? I shouted. About ten miles back, I reckon, came the answer. He knew no more than that, and the interchange over, I turned to Dorothy. Shall we run that clue down? I asked. She nodded decisively. By all means, she said. It's the only one we have. Send the arrow inshore, will you, Tom, on a long slant? Once more the engine took up its racing speed as the boat bore down on the shore. As we went in, we changed the questions and asked the few boats we met if they had picked up a man. At last we saw a cat boat just sailing out of a little bay and bore down on it. A man and a boy sat in the stern. As I shot at my question once more, the man jumped up. Yes, we picked one up. Where is he? I shouted. At my house, but he's crazy, replied the man. Can we get in there with the yacht? No, but I can take you in, he answered, and it was but a moment's work to lower a boat from the davits. As I stepped to the side, Tom and Dorothy hurried up. We're going to, Tom cried. The launch bore us rapidly across to the cat boat, and as we approached I studied the faces of the man and the boy. They were simple folk, of evidently limited intelligence. Hardly had we come alongside when I began my questions, and a strange story came in reply. Stripped of its vernacular and repetitions, this was the tale finally dragged from the man and boy as we sailed towards the shore. They had started out in the early morning and had fished with some success. In the afternoon they had seen a knockabout running free before the wind with all sorts of strange action. The sail widespread, she turned and reared, started and checked, swung and circled. There was no sign of life on board that they could ascertain, and they made up their minds that the boat had either lost its occupants or had been driven off shore with its sail hoisted. On boarding, much to their surprise, they found a man, apparently a solitary fisherman, lying unconscious in the stern sheets. Throwing water over him roused him. He sat up and looked around, but with unseen eyes. His lips quivered, and in a low whisper he began to speak. Disappeared. 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 Nothing real. Nothing real. Rising, he started to walk straight ahead, but struck the side and fell. His murmur now changed to a loud moan. Disappeared. 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 Nothing real. Nothing real. Again he tried to walk, but this time they caught him, bound him, and carried him to shore to their house, where he went quietly enough to bed with the unceasing moan. Disappeared. 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 Nothing real. Nothing real. Rising and falling like the waves on the shore. The story had taken all the way in, and as we rowed towards the shore, leaving the catboat and launch at the mooring where the knockabout lay, the night was swiftly shutting in, a light glimmering in a low house on the bluff. "'That's my house,' said the man, as we hastened towards it. A woman with a kindly face met us at the door. "'Wife, these are some folks that are looking for the crazy man,' said our friend. "'He's fast asleep,' was the answer, "'but you can go in and see him if you want.' My heart rose. The second step of my quest was in sight. Tom, I said quietly, come along with me. Miss Haldane, will you remain here? Dorothy nodded. Tom and I followed the woman as she passed down a narrow passage. Opening a rude door, she entered. In front of the bed, she stopped short and threw up her hands. For land's sake, she cried. He's gone. Gone? The word echoed dismally in my brain. Wait till I get a lamp, said the woman, and she pattered nervously out. By the fading light, we could see the disordered bed, the open window, and an overturned chair. A glimmer of light came down the passage, and the woman hurried back, followed by Dorothy. No more information could be gleaned. Evidently, the lost man had risen, dressed completely, and left by the low open window. The woman of the house was in great distress, weeping and rocking. The poor crazy man lost in these woods. He was as harmless as anything. I thought he was all right. Dorothy sat down beside her, and soothing her began a series of quiet questions. How long did you leave him? An hour or more she had been doing the supper dishes. Dorothy turned to the husband. What roads are there from here? Only one for a mile. That goes from the front of the house. The woman broke in. If he'd taken that, I'd have seen him. He'd gone by my window. He must have gone to the shore or the woods. There's no use waiting. He's only getting farther away from us, cried Tom. Let's look around the house. Our fisher friend had two lanterns and a kerosene light. With these we began the search. The sand and rock around the house gave no sign of footprints, and we passed out in widening circles, meeting and calling without avail. A half-hour's exploration left us just where we started. We had found nothing. Turning back, we met Dorothy at the door. 
i was afraid you would find nothing she said i've just found out that he said one thing besides a sentence which he continually repeated once he said the sea the sea the awful sea i believe he's gone to the shore together we went in that direction tom and the fisherman took one way dorothy and i the other as we hastened on the light of the lantern threw circles of hazy light on the black water and on the shore dorothy in the depths of thought walked on a little in advance and despite myself my thoughts turned from the man i sought and the errand for which i sought him and i gazed wholly at the round cheek shaded by a flying tress that escaped from the close veil and at the erect figure now stooping to look ahead now rising and passing on in deep thought the same thrill which had held me the first night came again that binding call that tightening chain i lost myself in a dreamy exhilaration suddenly dorothy stopped it's no use to go farther obediently i turned and we retraced our steps just below the house we met tom and the fisherman returned from an equally unavailing search we all four stood gazing out to see where the black arrow lay her lights the sole gemmed relief of the dark waters save where her searchlight blazed a widening path of changing silver before her all at once i saw dorothy raise her head with a quick breath if he's on the shore i know how we can find him no matter what start he has end of chapter two chapter three of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter three we waited anxiously for her next words the searchlight of the arrow will do it we can run the launch along the coast twice as fast as a man can walk or run and play the searchlight of the yacht on the shore as we go though simplicity itself it was the only plan that promised success and it took but little time to put it into operation the fisherman volunteered as pilot and while tom went back in the launch to give instructions to the captain we waited in the darkness of the little bay holding our lights as beacons the night without a single star but darkly showed the lapping waves and sighing pines which made the background of our tiny rocky amphitheatre tom had not covered half the distance to the yacht when we heard his hail and the searchlight swung at right angles limning the launch speeding from the shore in a lane of light we watched them till they reached the shadow of the side there was a brief interval before we saw the launch returning down the silvery way but as she neared us to our surprise we saw tom was not there in his stead came the first officer who touched his cap and said mr haldane will stay on the yacht and run the searchlight and has asked me to run the launch it was but the work of a moment to embark and the boat headed out of the cove towards the north the side agreed upon with tom up in the prow stood the officer at the wheel the fisherman pilot beside him the engineer bent over his small engine in the centre and in the stern sat dorothy and i peering into the space of light on the shore where played the searchlight bravely the little launch found her way forward with the slight chug-chug of her engine the only sound i could not rid myself of a feeling of unreality constantly we moved in light while all else was in shadow before us was the shore lighted as by a ghostly radiance on either side was darkness such darkness that we could barely distinguish the skyline of bluff and tree against the sky we neither spoke nor moved and the sailors forward scarce broke by a movement the silence with its single sound rising above the monotony of the waves dark green of pine and cedar lighter green of scrub oak yellow gray of sand dune soft brown warmth of massive boulder curling white where splashing waves broke on the glistening pebbles of the shore ragged stump and lofty maple all were etherealized by the silver shifting light it was a night of enchantment wherein i taken up by a genie from my dusty tasks had been placed beside a fairy queen to behold the wonders of eastern magic mile after mile rolled by with no result once we flashed our light on a startled fisherman lifting his lobster pots from his boat now and again we cast it on the veranda of summer cottage or on kitchen steps of farmhouse where we found men we inquired for the object of our search but it was all in vain and at last i looked questioningly at dorothy he could not have come so far as this she shook her head no she said regretfully we may as well turn 
but we'll find him on the other shore i feel certain he went to the sea she gave a low order to the officer at the wheel he raised the lantern thrice and the searchlight paused and reversed its way back over the ground we passed more swiftly this time than on our way up back to the cove where we started we went and from there we took our course southward along the shore we had gone perhaps three miles when the fisherman turned suddenly there's some one ahead there on the bluff on swept the searchlight and outlined on a little knoll scarcely fifty yards from us stood a man his hands stretched to heaven and an expression of awful doubt and agony on his face his lips moved and a moaning cry came from them quickly the engineer threw the lever and the sound of the engine ceased out of the stillness made yet more manifest by the stopping of the single accustomed sound came the moan disappeared 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 nothing real nothing real the man paid no attention to the light or to our boat he looked beyond us at the ocean with an unseen gaze hold the searchlight there i called in a low tone the officer raised his lantern twice and the searchlight stopped with the man in the centre of its field go on i said and the launch passed slowly on into the darkness in hurried tones i told dorothy my plans the fisherman and i would go ashore at the first point possible come up from behind and take him it was quickly and easily done the launch was brought close in shore where the fisherman and i could wade in and as we stole quietly up behind the man we could see that he had not moved his hands were still raised on high his lips still uttered the same moan to my surprise he offered no resistance and came quietly and peaceably on board the launch and the yacht where they put him to bed through the hole he never seized his plaint we looked for sign or letter that might show his identity but there was nothing however we had won the second step next came the question did he know anything of the alaska that was the last thing we discussed before turning in but it was not the last thing in my thoughts as i fell asleep i woke up next morning among the familiar sounds of new york harbor and came on deck to find tom and dorothy already there our visitor was safe he was still in a heavy sleep the newspapers had come on board and we found that the disappearance of the battleship was now known but that there was as yet no news in the excitement the story of the message from the man had been wholly forgotten every newspaper was searching but none had any clue the navy department could give no information though besieged by hundreds of the relatives and friends of the men on board there was no clue as to the identity of the insane man no paper reported any man as lost i thought the matter over as we breakfasted finally tom spoke what's the next move jim to open the mouth of this man here i answered i believe that he knows something that a sudden shock drove him crazy and our next move is to get him sane again how will you do that queried dorothy mm, i don't quite know i answered hesitatingly but i think i had better try some physician i want a bright resourceful specialist i know just the man said tom forrester he's making a name fast you know him dorothy dorothy nodded i don't think you can get a better man she said and so the next move was decided our man awoke with no change from the night before and with the same cry ever issuing from his lips tom went to shore phoned dr forrester and arranged for attendants to remove the unfortunate to a private hospital we preceded the carriage which was sent for him in tom's motor-car we had waited perhaps five minutes in dr forrester's office when he entered clear-cut with clean-shaven mouth and searching eyes he seemed the very man to solve our problem if it could be solved briefly i told him the condition here was an unknown man with absolutely no clue to his identity who we believed possessed certain information which we needed information of the utmost public importance our desire was to bring him back to a normal sanity and to learn his story my tale done forrester looked questioningly at tom it's all right doctor every bit of it said tom decisively i'm right behind this thing and it's perfectly straight my sister and i were with mr orrington when he found the man forrester rose as tom spoke the last words that's all that is necessary i shall be very glad to do what i can if you'll excuse me now i think that the patient has arrived if you care to wait i'll make a preliminary examination and let you know something of the result immediately for half an hour we waited anxiously for the verdict could dr forrester find the missing spring which would roll the curtain from that brain and enable it to give forth the information which might mean so much to me 
Finally the door opened and he entered. We sprang up. He shook his head. A most trying and puzzling case. There seems to have been absolutely no injury to the brain that can be recognized. None of the ordinary causes seem to have any share in the causation of this. I can do nothing for you today. I will try every means known to us in succession and report to you day by day. I felt baffled and seriously puzzled. It was most essential that I should get the story the moment the man recovered, if he did recover. It was equally essential that I should be free to hunt for new clues. Dorothy saw my anxiety. What is it, Mr. Orrington? she questioned, simply wondering how I could be in two places at the same time, here waiting and on the coast searching, I answered. I can settle that, said she. I'm going to take a week of observing in Tom's research laboratory, and I'll be right in reach of a telephone every minute. I objected in vain. Dorothy settled matters as she had settled them before. Tom and I were to go down the coast in the Black Arrow, returning every night to New York. She was to remain in the city. I reported my findings to the paper, and still the chief said, Wait, don't write anything till you have more. Keep at it till you have something. Morning after morning we telephoned the hospital and found no change. Day after day we spent in the Black Arrow searching the coast, or in the motor car skirting the shores. Evening after evening we spent in the library at the Haldanes, in endless discussion and consultation. The country was daily growing more and more alarmed. Rumors of war, of foreign fleets coming to attack our shores, filled the papers. Stories that the Alaska had been sent to the Pacific and had been seen in South American ports, that she had been seen in European waters, that she had struck a derelict and badly disabled was coming slowly in, were current. Every story run to earth proved a fake, and every day had a new story. The government knew no more than anyone else, and had been driven to a sphinx-like silence and defense. They had employed, as had the newspapers, every known means of getting some news of the battleship, but all in vain. The Alaska had disappeared on Monday or Tuesday of the first week in July. On Tuesday we had found the man who was still gazing with unseen eyes at the bare wall of the hospital room, still moaning the same cry. In six days he had never varied it but twice. And both those times he repeated his words in the cottage, the sea, the awful sea. Experiment after experiment had been tried without avail. Two consultations with the best alienists of the city had given Dr. Forrester no more light. Six days of searching the coast gave us not a single clue. On Monday night we reached the wharf about six to find Dorothy waiting for us in the automobile. As we rode up town, she rapidly explained the plan for the evening. They tried a high-frequency current on the patient today, said Dorothy, and it seemed to have the first effect. He stopped his plaint, went off to sleep, and woke silent for the first time. He did not drop back into his old condition until three hours later. They're going to try it again, as soon as we get there. In one of Dr. Forrester's offices stood the high-frequency apparatus. Before it sat the man, his eyes staring before him, his lips moving with his moaning cry. The doctor moved the cup-shaped terminal above his head, adjusted the negatives, then nodded to the nurse at the switch. Slowly increasing in sound and speed went the motor. Hissing low and sibilantly shot the vibrant discharge. Five minutes passed as we gazed intently on the man in the chair. Five more, and yet five more. His words came slowly, drowsily now. The harsh, clashing syllables became a low hum. He dropped off into sleep, breathing regularly, and the nurse threw off the switch. "'That regular sleep is a great gain,' said Forrester. "'He'll probably wake soon.' Silently we sat waiting. The clock ticked loudly. I fell at once to my constant occupation, watching Dorothy. She sat beside Tom, her eager face bent intently on the man so intently that it would seem as if she must obtain the secret from his sleeping form. I had watched her expressive face for perhaps half an hour. Forrester had been out and returned. When the man stirred drowsily, put his hand up to his eyes, rubbed them, yawned, and looked up. "'Where, where am I?' he said stumblingly. "'Where's the boat?' he went on. Forrester soothed him. "'You're all right,' he said. "'You've had an accident, but you're all right again.' The man sank back resignedly. Well, he began, and then a wave of remembrance flashed across his face, a look of horror. 
we bent forward instinctively hanging on his words where's the ship he cried what's happened to the alaska i, I saw her disappear for god's sake tell me i didn't the red flush in his face grew deeper his breath grew laboured and the watching physician stepping beside his bared arm brought something concealed in his hand against it once twice oh said the man shrinking what and then without another word he became unconscious i jumped up in excitement couldn't you have i began but forrester stopped me i let him say all that was safe wait three hours and he will probably be all right he smiled somewhat exultantly the high frequency did it somehow it seems to rearrange the disordered parts by the electric flow why do you think the high frequency current did the work when all other methods failed asked tom as we descended the stairs forrester pulled at his chin with an air of abstraction i don't really know he answered frankly the action is almost as if some electrical matter in the patient had been jarred by an electrical shock and when the high frequency got control it put things back into shape readjusted the parts as it were i don't believe at all that the shock of seeing the battleship go down did the whole mischief there was something else something decidedly out of the common mixed up in the case as we waited i telephoned the office and found the chief still there victory is in sight i said save as many columns as you can you can have all you want came back over the wire i asked for a desk and began to write i sketched the scene in the war department quoted the entire message from the man who was trying to stop all war reviewed briefly what was known of the ship and of her disappearance and told of our search down the coast and of the finding of the man upstairs hour after hour went by as i wrote and no call came dorothy and tom sat reading at last i brought my story down to the point where i wished to introduce the story of the man there i stopped and with idle pen sat and watched the beautiful head below the shaded light if a man could only sit and see that picture of a woman reading every night i found myself figuring costs of living more zealously than ever before a knock broke in on my thoughts the patient is roused said the nurse and the doctor would like to have you come silently we passed through the bare corridors and up the wide stairs as we entered the doctor sat beside the man on the narrow iron bed i looked with eager inquiry at the face it shone with normal intelligence we had conquered again i have just been telling mr joslin of your finding him and of his being here said forrester now he is ready to talk dorothy greeted him and began the talk while i wrote feverishly as joslin spoke in a low steady tone yes he had gone out fishing he had left a little shooting box whither he had run down alone on monday and taken the knockabout out the reason no one had known of his disappearance was that there was no one to care he had no family and had retired from business made little trips now and then so his landlady and friends simply thought of him as away i chafed at the time that he took in coming to the point if only he reached it his long description of his acts was all a part of the story then came the crisis i was out ten or twelve miles from the shore just about sunset said joslin when i saw a battleship coming up the coast she was the only ship in sight and she passed within a short distance of me so near that i felt the last of her wake i never saw a finer spectacle than that boat as she swept on he paused go on go on i said anxiously i knew it was the alaska he resumed because i had seen her lying for weeks below my apartment house in riverside drive i watched her as she went on triumphant it was a time of evening colors out across the water came the bugle call which i had heard so often as i hung over the parapet of the drive at nightfall the marine guard and the crew stood mustered and facing aft the flag fell a fluttering inch and at the moment of its fall the band crashed into the full strain of the star-spangled banner i stood with bared head and my eyes filled as the great ship bore proudly on just as the last note of o long may it wave came to me like a bursting soap bubble like a light cloud scattered by the wind she disappeared without a sound not so much as the splash of a pebble in the water could i hear do you mean to say cried tom in utter amazement that all those thousands of tons of armored steel those great guns in their huge turrets that terrific mass of metal disappeared without a sound absolutely without a sound answered joslin gravely the alaska disappeared with less commotion than a ring of tobacco smoke in the air 
it utterly destroyed one's belief in the reality of anything in this world bewilderment complete bewilderment is the only word which can express the appearance of our little group as we stood in the bare room even forrester temporarily forgot his professional attitude in the absorbing interest of the tale but a sigh from joslyn recalled him that's quite enough mr joslyn he said hurriedly and at his nod of dismissal we turned and went down the stairs nothing real with a vengeance remarked tom as we descended i can't imagine a more unearthly spectacle than that noiseless fading away i'd have said mirage if he hadn't heard the music and if the ship hadn't actually disappeared hold on if this is the work of man is it possible that he has discovered some new substance which placed in armored steel causes it to disintegrate if he got hold of such stuff he might get it into armored steel while it was making and then after a certain time the whole thing might crumble away tom had finished speaking as he stood in the door of the doctor's pleasant library dorothy nodded as he closed that's not a bad idea tom if anything could be found that would make steel crumble into dust as a puffball crumbles it might of course be timed but the whole thing dazes me i, I want plenty of time to think it over and i must get to work on my story i said trying to shake myself back into the world of reality again and i rushed back to my desk word for word i wrote the story drew joslyn's life history briefly ran rapidly through the hole and as dorothy entered i know how i'll end i exclaimed i'll prophesy the sinking of a british battleship this week she clapped her hands good good she cried you couldn't do better the last words of my story were the prophecy and i hurried to the telephone it was one a m but the chief himself answered i'll be there with the whole story in half an hour i cried exultantly did he see her go down asked the chief eagerly he did i answered and a long whistle came over the wires through dark streets and light through the roar of upper broadway and the sombre silence of lower broadway the motor ran and i tried to calm my hurrying brain the excitement which had possessed me every day of the week was still over me the awful wonder of joslyn's tale possessed me until my longed-for beat seemed but a minor accident in the great happenings of the world up the elevator and through the door at a bound i passed to the chief's office he reached eagerly from his chair for my copy page by page he read silently and as i sat handing them to him and passing them from his hands to the boys running back and forth to the tubes i could hear the crash of the presses and i thought strangely enough of pendennis and warrington standing in fleet street and talking of the mightiest engine of the world the press and after all it was my story that was enlightening the world through those great presses below i had solved the mystery that filled the newspapers from the atlantic to the pacific nay more that was discussed in the clubs of london and of tokyo and my story would go through them all i had won twice only i stopped in giving the copy to the chief once to light my pipe and once to look up joslyn i found him easily in the directory and in bradstreet's he was evidently a man of complete reliability the last page has gone down the tube and the chief leaned back and meditatively took up his pipe that's the best stuff for some years orrington he said i guess you better take this as a permanent assignment the prophecy was a long chance but i guess we'll take it now go to bed i slept till ten but once up i read my story with huge approval in my early paper and i saw everybody else reading it as i went downtown my ears were filled with excited comment and i examined with much glee the pained comments or total silence of our contemporaries especially did they condemn my prophecy reaching the office i stopped on the first floor to get a late edition among a general stare which i endeavored to bear modestly at the elevator door i paused hmm should i walk or ride walk it is i decided i wanted to stop in the hall outside the big office to look over my story again as i sat in the hall window i looked down i could see a multitude before our bulletin board none of the other papers had any crowd at all as i looked the throng went wild a great roar rose and the mass seethed and swayed as they gazed at the bulletin below me but out of my sight something's up i said to myself and bolted for the office the reporters and editors were all clustered in one corner as they saw me a shout went up warrington the british battleship dreadnought number eight has disappeared end of chapter three
Chapter Four of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Four the disappearance of his britannic majesty's battleship dreadnought number eight sent the world wild two great nations had suffered severe blows and lay in quivering expectation of the future the chief of my paper smiled at me more amicably than ever before as i entered the office the third day after the british battleship disappeared utterly in the channel you'd better run that prophecy of yours about the french battleship to-day he said and then keep out of the office i don't want you to be in evidence we've got too good a thing to take any chances work as hard as you want on the assignment but don't appear publicly i nodded acquiescence by the way he went on just how many people outside of our own staff know of the second letter seven i answered the president the secretary of war the two haldanes and their cousin mrs hartnell richard regnier and john king the former secretary of the navy did know but he's dead they are all pledged to secrecy and all have kept the story wholly to themselves that's all said the chief and i left that night i sent in a prediction that a french battleship would sink within a week and then spent the next few days going over the naval registers of the nations and in correlating the mass of data concerning the navies of the world which had been collected at the office by my request i wanted to get all the information concerning the subject in hand that i could possibly obtain immersed in masses of data struggling with theory after theory that arose only to be rejected i passed the week weary from my labors one afternoon i left my work to go to the haldanes to report progress tom and dorothy were both immersed in a research tom was carrying on but they always had time to discuss the great question i had a letter from dick regnier yesterday said dorothy the first words over he says he's doing some work he has long wanted to do he speaks of seeing john king at cowes john had his new yacht down there i followed every word intently nothing at all about the loss of the alaska or the dreadnought number eight i asked significantly no answered dorothy when was the letter mailed i asked two days after the british ship went down she answered but she stopped as tom came in i continued the conversation no further as i left tom called after me i've been fooling with some phosphorescent paint he said and i've run down a few interesting results don't you want to come up to the laboratory tomorrow morning about three o'clock we're going to run some tests between twelve midnight and five in the morning so as to have the least current and vibration that the city can give i'll be glad to come i answered instantly no chance to be near dorothy was ever to be refused last revellers were just passing from the great white way as i rode uptown in a late surface car which held beside myself only a few dull and sleepy workers i was ahead of time and as i came up near riverside drive i jumped off the car and walked down towards the drive and up by the river below me in the full moonlight lay an american fleet the white sides and lofty turrets of the ships stood sharply outlined against the other bank they seemed to personify the might of the nation resting there in huge impassive stolidity fearful of nothing ready for all yet as i remembered joslin's words vanished like a breaking soap bubble spoken of the alaska i shuddered at the helplessness of those floating forts massive as they were i looked at my watch in the moonlight quarter of three i turned and made my way to the gray stone building on the height which held the research laboratory i found tom and dorothy bending over a series of instruments under a big incandescent light i watched them for a moment silently then as they rose from their task i greeted them never had dorothy looked more charming than in this setting of bare walls and severe tables hooded instruments and wires glass cases and shelves most girls whom i had seen at three o'clock in the morning as they left a ballroom were sorry spectacles worn and dishevelled dorothy in her trim working clothes was as fresh as a summer's morn her first greeting over she turned to her work again adjusting a micrometer levelling screw what are you doing i asked idly adjusting a reflectoscope to detect the presence of radioactive waves tom is just going to have his assistant test the radium he is to use to-night and has half a dozen reflectoscopes here she waved her hand at the bench before her where half a dozen similar instruments were placed they are a good deal like the old electroscopes only infinitely more sensitive you see that gold leaf she pointed to two tiny ribbons of gold that hung limply together 
when away from a radioactive source such as radium comes along those ribbons fly apart all our reflectoscopes are discharged now but they'll be charged later as we spoke tom joined us i've sent jones downstairs for the radium in the safe dorothy he said and we three stood looking silently at the instruments before us through the open windows a fresh breeze fluttered in and the soft night gave back but the slightest hum a minimum of that sound that never ceases in the quietest hours of the great city a church tower rang out one two three four tom glanced at the chronometer just right he said and looked back a strange hush filled the air again a terrific force seemed to be pulling me towards dorothy but my eyes never turned from the reflectoscopes suddenly as i gazed the golden ribbon sprang to life parted and stood stiffly separate good heavens cried tom what did that they were perfectly insulated what did that dorothy it must be jones bringing the radium dorothy's eyes glowed with excited interest i don't think it was jones she said eagerly i believe i know what it was but anyway let's go first and see where jones is there's absolutely nothing else in the laboratory that could have charged them insulated as they were down the stairs flight after flight four and all we trooped and found jones in an office on the first floor seated in a chair before the safe looking disconsolately at its closed door at tom's voice he rose professor i've forgotten the combination again i was sitting here trying to bring it to mind then you haven't taken the radium from the safe at all shouted tom in wild excitement no answered jones staring in amazement then how in blazes did those reflectoscopes get charged jones showed a sudden interest have they got charged again yes have they been charged before twice before and i meant to speak to you about it but it slipped my mind when did it happen dorothy broke in i've got full particulars noted down uh, upstairs said jones but how about that combination never mind that cried tom let me see your data rapidly we ascended the slower jones following some way behind in the laboratory the assistant turned to a littered desk and fumbled among a mass of papers i could see that dorothy was burning with impatience which i could not understand jones fumbled on picking up paper after paper peering at them blindly through his black-rimmed spectacles tom seized my arm and walked me down the room impatiently that man will drive me mad some day he exclaimed he's the most accurate investigator and observer we ever had but he keeps his desk in an unspeakable mess he's got that data somewhere and when he finds it it will be correct but he'll take perhaps an hour to find it there oh thank the lord he remarked as we turned back dorothy's taking a hand then came order from chaos regularity from irregularity paper by paper was read rejected and placed in its appropriate place while jones looked on by no means displeased scarcely five minutes had passed and the desk had assumed an order foreign to its nature ten minutes passed and dorothy turned it isn't here mr jones now think where did you put it jones seized the knotty problem bent his mind to it struggled with it emerged victorious i know he said it's in the middle of that black leather notebook in the third right-hand drawer before he had finished the notebook was in dorothy's hand was open and a paper fluttered out into her lap she picked it up and read july third nineteen something reflectoscopes charged without apparent cause at three forty five thirty p m july eleventh nineteen something reflectoscopes charged without apparent cause between nine thirty five and ten ten p m i thought so i thought so said dorothy jumping from her chair tom it's as straight as a die oh jim it's a big step tom looked as bewildered as poor jones had seen before the safe or as he did now i was thoroughly puzzled the only thing that struck me forcibly was that dorothy had called me by my first name that was a big step surely but evidently it was not the step she meant dorothy saw our bewilderment and went on emphatically you are stupid i'd like to know how far you men would get in this world without women to find things out for you what happened on july third in the afternoon and what occurred some time in the evening our time on july eleventh tom and i stood still looking at each other in bewilderment suddenly i saw a great light why those were the times the alaska and the dreadnought number eight disappeared i shouted in wildest excitement and just now a french battleship went down said dorothy gravely and she broke her sentence with a brief sob oh, the poor wives and children 
we had turned instinctively to watch the golden ribbons that told of the sinking of the proud battleship and of the death of hundreds and i bowed my head as when the death angel comes close beside us in his flight a moment's silence and tom turned to jones if you don't mind jones i wish you would say nothing of this no matter what you see or hear we shall do no more to-night you may go home with jones's departure we began another council tom drew out his pipe dorothy i know jim and i need to smoke over this do you mind and at her word we filled our pipes and invoked the help of that great aid to philosophers tobacco dorothy was at the desk her brow knotted in deep thought tom and i sat on a side bench against the wall facing her the dawn was coming in through the wide windows and the city stirred as we talked your theory about the disintegrating steel of battleships was evidently wrong tom said dorothy the wave that charged the reflectoscopes was a wave definitely projected from some definite place yes said tom musingly i was wrong the man who is trying to stop all war must have some radioactive generator some means of wave disturbance greater than anything we have yet attained as a man starts a dynamo and uses the electricity it furnishes to do work so this man starts this unknown engine of destruction and its waves destroy the ship but how could he possibly cause a ship to vanish without a sound i asked of course i'm not perfectly sure answered dorothy but the moment the reflectoscopes were charged i thought of a possible theory his force so powerful that it affects our reflectoscopes thousands of miles away may be able to resolve the metal which makes up a battleship into its electrons which would disappear as intangible gas what are electrons i persisted i've heard of them of course but i'm not quite sure what they are they're the very smallest division of matter the infinitely small particles that make up the atom if a man could find a way to break matter down to them it's entirely possible that they would then go off as a gas the waves the man sends out must be terrifically strong anyway one thing i don't see though is how he could break down organic matter he could break down everything metallic perhaps but i don't see how he could break down wood or human beings she ended with a shudder part of that's easy said tom with a long whiff at his pipe absolutely no wood for the last two years on any battleship all nations have taken out what wood they had on their new ships and put in metal of some sort i don't know about the action on man it's not essential to settle that now the excitement of the moment had been so great standing in the midst of history-making had been so poignant that for the nonce my newspaper instinct had been lost in the stronger thrill now it suddenly awoke great scott i cried i must get this to the paper instantly where's the telephone without a word tom pointed to the desk phone on his own desk and i rushed over to it again and again i rang with no response i can't get central i said tom looked at the clock it's a branch exchange but there's usually someone on our exchange board by now i'll try five more precious minutes were lost in his attempt to gain the board at last he looked up no use jim i waited for no more but grabbed my hat and ran down the long flights out across the square i sped and down the street a bluebell showed on the corner in a small store i ran to it <sighs> locked another block and i had the same experience at the third a corner drug store i met success a yawning boy sweeping out the store gazed with open mouth as hot and perspiring from my run i hurried in and rushed to the booth in a moment i had the office and the night editor's desk had told him who i was and began to dictate at one minute past four by our time uh, see what time paris time is for that and put it in a french battleship was sunk by the man who is to stop all war probably no one on board escaped the last was a guess based on the experience of the past the night editor's voice came back feel sure of this orrington very sure i said i hate to run a thing like this on a chance the chief said to run anything i sent didn't he yes said the night editor well rush it in then before word comes all right if you insist came back and i hung up the phone paid my fee and departed i slept like a log until eleven then rose to gather in the file of morning papers outside my door my statement was in big headlines in my own paper no other morning paper had a single word of it i paused at the newsstand as i went down to breakfast staring from every paper was the headline la patrie number three disappeared french battleship follows the alaska and the dreadnought number eight they had the news from france five hours after we had published it 
leisurely i ate my breakfast the while i read the late news of my rivals turning with especial interest to an editorial of my own paper commenting on my work and reviewing the situation this should mean another big jump in circulation i thought to myself and another jump in salary too my salary was really getting up to a point where marriage was the only sensible thing for a man to do i was to meet the haldanes at three i wondered how long an acquaintance should last before one could propose as i sipped my last cup of coffee i saw two men in the dining-room door speaking to a waiter who nodded and led them my way they were not the type of men who usually breakfasted in the restaurant just before me they stopped mr orrington said one inquiringly i am james orrington i answered the waiter had gone back to the kitchen we were left alone in the rear of the dining-room the man who had spoken opened his coat and showed a silver shield we're a secret service officials you are under arrest End of chapter four Chapter Five of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Five. This is an outrage! I exclaimed indignantly. Why should I be put under arrest? on complaint of the french government as being concerned in the sinking of the french battleship la patrie number no. three off brest this morning replied the officer coolly as it is an international complaint it came under the federal courts and we were empowered to make the arrest as he spoke the whole thing flashed across me my predictions of the destruction of the dreadnought number no. eight and of la patrie number no. three had come true i had told of the sinking at the very moment it occurred my story had been spread over the world by cable and by wireless and my arrest as an accomplice in the act was the result i immediately felt more cheerful the charge is too absurd to stand for a moment i said i am entirely ready to go with you back upstairs with my two companions i went for my hat and then i accompanied them to the federal building the inquiry was sharp and searching i admitted unhesitatingly that i had written the original account of the sinking of the alaska and had prophesied the loss of the dreadnought number eight and of la patrie number no. three also that i had given information of the sinking of the ship an hour or two before it had been known in france on being questioned as to the source of my knowledge i gave the account already published of the discovery of the man who saw the alaska disappear and spoke of the original letter sent by the man who intended to stop all war of the two essential factors the discovery of the hidden letter and the charging of the reflectoscopes i did not speak these were valuable assets to me as long as they were not made public i could not throw them away they meant higher salary greater reputation and these things meant a third far more essential than either my story done the judge sat for some moments without moving finally he spoke frankly mr orrington i cannot see that you have explained that inside information which enabled you to make your predictions or tell of the loss of la patrie number no. three you are the only person who seems to know anything of this you offer no explanation of your knowledge i do not see that i can do otherwise than commit you without bail commit me without bail keep me from following out my assignment keep me from seeing dorothy i thought rapidly of course there was a solution i addressed the judge your honor i gave this information in advance to the president and to the secretary of war if you will get either one of them on the telephone they will corroborate my words the judge's attitude changed if that proves correct i shall have no reason to detain you he said and turning to a court officer he ordered him to call up washington state the case to the president's private secretary and ask the president for a statement if you cannot get the president get the secretary of war i broke in and the judge said very well i did not want to bring the office into this at all if i could help it i was out playing a lone hand with the whole responsibility resting on me and i did not wish to ask for aid if i could possibly avoid it i thought of the haldanes but decided to save them for a last resort i could not bear to think of dorothy in the courtroom for a long half-hour i waited reading the morning papers till the return of the messenger he entered and walked before the bench your honor the president has gone shooting in virginia he will not return for three days and can only be seen on urgent official business the secretary of war is dangerously ill and cannot be disturbed 
i remembered with a shock that i had seen the second fact in the newspapers of the first i had no knowledge as he heard the news the judge again shook his head i cannot release you on that mere statement mr orrington is there anything else you would like to have done i gave way with an inward sigh yes telephone if you will to professor thomas haldane in his laboratory saying that i am under arrest here and ask him to come and bring a lawyer another weary period of waiting in the stifling heat passed before the door opened and tom entered accompanied by another man hello old man this is a shame ejaculated tom as he came towards me as his lawyer went up to the bench for an interview with the judge he went on in a lower tone it's a shame jim but i expected it what i said in amazement i expected it repeated tom it was the only logical outcome of your prophecies you had too much inside information people couldn't help suspecting you knew more than you had told you were the only person on whom they could lay their hands it's really not surprising at all that you are here the only thing is we've got to get you out of this right off he turned to the lawyer can't you get the judge to take my word that i know all the circumstances and can swear to mr orrington's innocence the lawyer went up to the bench and had a brief conversation with the judge in a few moments he returned i hope i have solved the difficulty said he the judge will accept your statement and mr orrington's together if you will explain the whole thing to him he will see that it goes to no one save the attorney-general you'd better do it said tom briefly i suppose i'll have to i replied we adjourned to the judge's private office and told the whole story i can understand said the judge as i finished that the story of the disappearance of the french battleship might be a lucky guess once given the letter of which you speak but the narrative as told by you seems almost too incredible to be admitted as evidence is this letter containing the second message still in your possession no i said and hesitated tom broke in it's in my sister's hands judge she has had it ever since that first night if you will wait i will get some radium from my laboratory and show the hidden message to you it could not then disappear in the time which has elapsed queried the judge no answered tom decisively i have been experimenting with inks of that kind since i knew of this and i should say unhesitatingly that it would still be there although i've never happened to see it myself i'll bring the things back at once my motor is at the door by that time i had exhausted the news possibilities of the newspapers and was left to the real estate columns which was better for a young couple a small apartment in the city or a suburban home <laughs> that was a question which made even the flamboyant advertisements of farthest suburbia a matter of deep and abiding interest to me i was half through the columns when to my joy and surprise the door opened and dorothy entered followed by tom and the lawyer at her coming the nodding court officer roused and became a model of soldierly deportment the secret service men straightened in their chairs the judge felt of his tie and rose hastily to offer a seat beside him with a courtly bow gracious and stately dorothy bowed to him but she came to me oh jim she said in a low voice what a shame i'm so glad i was here to help i passed the gap from miss haldane to dorothy at a bound dorothy i answered i'm so glad you were after that how little mattered the long weary afternoon it took but a few minutes to arrange a closet off the judge's room for the exhibition of the evidence as dorothy brought forth the letter which had been the forerunner of three mighty tragedies the judge asked to see it and read it curiously and there is a second letter below this miss haldane he queried yes answered dorothy i have seen it have you had this in your possession ever since the night's meeting of which your brother and mr orrington spoke he asked again it has been in my personal possession or in a locked drawer of my own in a locked safe in my own house replied dorothy i asked mr orrington for it as i intended to make some tests with my brother on the ink we have however not used it as yet are you ready to swear that this is the original letter i am said dorothy calmly very well then let us go on with the test the letter was placed open as before with the radium in its leaden case before it tom threw back the cover as we sat in front of the table and turned off the lights i waited as before beside dorothy if i had felt a tightening bond before i felt one a thousand times stronger now i had seen the dear girl beside me day in and day out since our first meeting and never had she failed to show the same fire of brilliant imagination the same power of achievement she had blazed my path to success in the weeks past she had come to help me in my distress to-day to gain her had become the whole end of my life 
i looked into the darkness towards the letter expecting each moment to see the curves and lines springing out luminous minute after minute passed i could hear the ticking of the great clock two rooms away and the stifled roar of the summer afternoon in the great city but the darkness held no light no line appeared finally tom spoke how long an exposure did you give it last time dorothy two or three minutes said she he rose turned on the lights and looked at his watch twelve minutes and no results it's the same lot of radium too look this over with me will you dorothy they examined the apparatus carefully turned off the light and tried again no result tom went back into the other room and brought another sample of radium and used that still no result at last he turned on the lights and spoke i can't understand judge but i cannot bring out the second letter the judge rose blinking according to your own statements he said the letter has not been out of miss haldane's possession at all and the message once on there could not disappear i fear i shall have to hold mr orrington after all till we can hear from the president my heart sank tom turned to me never you mind jim we'll find the president for you and have you out inside two days i smiled somewhat wearily you mustn't leave your work to do that tom dorothy broke in we can't work alone it needs all three of us to get anywhere doesn't it tom sure thing said tom sturdily and they left me but not before dorothy had given me a word of comfort that was a stay in time of trouble i had often watched the gloomy walls of the prison as i passed and wondered at the sensations of the prisoners when the gates closed behind them my sensations as i drove into the courtyard and passed up the stairs into the cell whose iron gate clanged shut behind me were all poignant enough but i could not be wholly downhearted the whole thing seemed utterly absurd yet as night came on a deep gloom gradually settled over me i could not see my way out suppose the president and secretary of war should both die as had the last secretary of the navy i had no proof but the letter and the witnesses who saw the second message shine forth and with that thought of witnesses came back the puzzling question why did not the second message appear it had been there i had seen it with my own eyes dorothy mrs hartnell john king regnier each and all had seen it and read it tom had declared it impossible for the writing to disappear what could be the explanation one thought kept coming returning to my mind again and again as i sat on the edge of my narrow cot watching the barred moonlight streaming through the great window opposite my tier the letter must have been changed the letter which we examined in the judge's room could not be the same as that which had shown us the second message somewhere somehow an exchange must have been effected it could have been no easy matter either parchment of the kind used in all the letters was no easy thing to come by it could by no means be bought in every stationer's store nor could so complete a copy of the message be produced without much trouble and labor only one man would be likely to have such a copy ready at hand without the second message the man who was trying to stop all war he might have an extra copy but how could he know the letter was in dorothy's hands how could he get a chance to change the papers hour after hour the long night through i struggled with the question and with the morning some crystallization came from the dull haze of my thoughts there was one time and place where a man might easily make an exchange at mrs hartnell's house in washington in the time which elapsed between the closing of the radium case and the turning on of the lights it might be improbable but it was the only solution i could find towards early morning i dropped off into a troubled sleep and dreamed i was in court where regnier as judge was trying me with john king as prosecuting attorney i had just been condemned to disappear as had the alaska when dorothy sailed through the courtroom in the black arrow's launch with tom at the wheel she reached out her hand to me and i leapt in and escaped the late morning brought me a weary and exhausted waking i had breakfast brought in from outside sent word to the office that i would not be in for a few days a by no means uncommon thing for me to do since i went on this assignment and then i settled down to wait i got enough waiting before eight o'clock that evening to last me the rest of my natural life but at that hour came a warder with a short request to follow him to the office there was tom good fellow rushing towards me as i entered you're a free man jim i have the order for your release he cried the president came to your rescue like the trump he is hurry up now and come to our house for a late dinner the clang of the gates behind me was as much music to my ears as it had been discord on my entrance i had endured all the prison life that i wanted i was willing to leave any writing up of such experiences to the yellow newspaper reporter fifth avenue never seemed so gay 
new york never seemed so full of the wine of life as on that drive it needed only dorothy to make it complete and i was speeding towards her as rapidly as the speed regulations would allow as we went on tom told me the story of his search for the president how he had found him off shooting in virginia and how gladly he had given the word for my release once in the hall of the haldane's house dorothy appeared at the head of the stairs oh jim she cried thank heaven she had forgotten all about mr orrington now oh jim i'm so glad it's all right now isn't it it is i said emphatically she hurried down waving a blue foreign-looking sheet oh boys i've got the best thing yet we can tell just where the man is now i've just found out the way End of chapter five chapter six of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter six what's the new find dorothy asked tom smiling at her eagerness a letter from carl dinkel she replied impossible the dear old boy died nine months ago but this was written nearly a year ago she rejoined look at this envelope the big blue square inscribed in crabbed german script was filled with addresses see said dorothy he thought you were still at columbia so he addressed it to columbia america forgetting new york his u was so much like an o that they sent it to columbia south america it travelled half over south america and then they sent it up here it went to three or four Columbias and Columbuses in different states. Finally, some bright man sent it to the university, and they sent it over to you. It's for you, all right. Read it, Dorothy. What does he say? On Herrn Dr. Thomas Haldane, Lieber Professor, es geht mir an den Tod. She had gone thus far in German, when she glanced up and saw my uncomprehending face. The German too much for you? She asked. I'll translate. She went on rapidly in English. To Dr. Thomas Haldane dear professor i am about to die my physician tells me that i have less than a month left to work i have just completed the apparatus which had engaged my attention exclusively for the last six years my wave measuring machine by means of this machine any wave of a given intensity may be registered as regards its velocity and power if you don't mind i'd like to break in right there i interrupted go on said tom what kind of waves is he talking about is this some sort of a machine for measuring the tides down on the beach or what is it tom laughed not exactly he said dinkel's machine is to measure waves like those of electrical energy you know don't you that we believe wireless messages go from one station to another by means of ether waves as they call them i nodded well dinkel means to measure waves of that kind and waves that would come from an arc lamp or a dynamo or a piece of radium or anything like that it's to measure the same sort of wave that charged the reflectoscopes, in short. See? I do, I answered. But I'll hold on till we finish the letter, Jim, and we'll go over it. I subsided, and Dorothy went on. More than that, the distance from the point of generation of the wave and the exact direction from which it comes can be ascertained. It is, as you may see, the unique discovery of the past five years. In computing and making it, I have used some discoveries made by my late colleague, Professor Mingjern, at his death six years ago. He passed his work on to me. Now that my death approaches, I pass my work on to you. I have had many pupils in my long life, but none so worthy, none so able to carry on the work as you, my dear friend and pupil. Farewell. Carl Denkel. He was as fine an old chap as I ever knew, said Tom, with deep feeling, to think of his sending that to me. But what can have happened to it dorothy stood with a second sheet in her hand here's something about it she said manuscripts sent under cover to same address apparatus sent to new york via hamburg american line oh then the first thing to do is find the apparatus said tom we can send a trailer after the manuscript but we can't bank on getting it i'll go down to the custom house tomorrow morning what a blow to science if the whole thing were lost but he went on suddenly isn't it extraordinary that this should come along just now it helps us a whole lot that is so remarked dorothy reflectively we ought to be able to tell just where the man is every time once more i humbly confess my ignorance 
i remarked but will you kindly enlighten me as to the way in which this is to help us in the search for the man certainly said dorothy smiling we know that the reflectoscopes were charged by a wave which the man sent out from some definite spot theoretically that place might be anywhere in the world practically it's probably somewhere not many miles from the ship he is destroying but it is somewhere his waves start from some definite point there is some single point of generation now with this machine i ought to be able to find out just where the place is from which the wave starts and not only within a hundred miles but within a very brief space say for instance we had the machine in london i could tell that the man started his waves from sandy hook and not from hellgate that power of fixing the exact position of the man gives us a tremendous step absolutely tremendous i cried and tom chimed in his eyes blazing with enthusiasm here's to the successful working out of the new clue the announcement of dinner made rather an anticlimax to our discovery tom laughed well we've got to eat anyway come on no feast could equal a dinner with dorothy as hostess never did her sweet face look more charming than when she presided at her own board the talk soon became confined to technicalities as dorothy and tom discussed the possibilities of the new apparatus and i sat watching dorothy's expressive face as she talked of velocities and lengths methods of generation and of control but her absorption in her subject lasted but a brief time dinner over she turned to the piano then for two hours her music wafted me through many a lofty old iberian turret as i walked to my rooms from the haldanes i reveled in every breath of the city air the very noises of the street exhilarated me as i strolled along one of the crowd a free man the unexpected setback of my arrest now safely over i could attack the new clue with eagerness and the early morning found all three of us at the hamburg american pier no trace of any such invoice as carl dinkel had described was to be found in any of the office records book after book was searched for some account of the shipment but in vain as a last resort we went out to the huge warehouses and searched them up and down back and forth the morning passed in unavailing work we swung up to town to lunch and then turned again to our task the most unruly of warehousemen turned into an obedient slave at dorothy's behest and from one long bare shed to another we passed escorted by a retinue of willing workers we paused at length at the end of the pier where the big doors looked out on the water glowing beneath the sun the burly irishman who had been our escort from the first took off his cap and wiped his wet brow i'm feared it's no use mum he said apologetically sure and i'd go on for hours a hunting for you if twas any use but it's never a bit we've been everywhere that a machine like that could be with regret we gave up our futile search and retraced our steps toward the waiting car we had seated ourselves and were watching the chauffeur as he bent to crank the machine when we heard a cry behind us we turned and saw our guide running at full speed his arms waving wildly as he came near he shouted there's just one chance i remembered myself that a while ago there was a lot of old unclaimed and sea stuff sent to the appraiser stars to be auctioned off they've been having the sale the day and to-morrow at three you might find it there we'll try said tom and we quickly ran across to the auction as we stepped inside the room we saw a motley assembly before us junk dealers jew peddlers old clothesmen clerks buyers of hardware houses and a few reporters a lot of fancy door bolts were being sold and competition was running high foremost among the bidders was a woman who was evidently an old acquaintance of the auctioneers she was a queer compromise between the old and the new on the tight brown wig of the conservative old jewish matron was set askew a gay lacy hat such as adorns the head of an east side bell on a tamani picnic her costume was in harmony with her headgear consisting of a black skirt and a flaming red waist trimmed with gorgeous gold embroidery her keen eyes twinkled at the badinage of the auctioneer and her face showed an acumen hard to overcome one by one the bidders withdrew till only this woman and another jew an old man were left the price was mounting by cents till the last limit of the woman's purse seemed reached and she stopped bidding in vain the auctioneer tried to rouse her to another bid twenty-six twenty-six absolutely thrown away at twenty-six come mrs rosnowski give me thirty you can sell the lot for fifty it's the chance of your life mrs rosnowski was not to be moved again the auctioneer appealed in vain and glancing around him he reached down beside him and brought up a dusty broken mixture of wires and metals of cones and cylinders here mrs rosnowski make it thirty and i'll throw this in 
as the eyes of my companions lighted on the mass they started forward tom opened his mouth to bid but before the words could come from his lips mrs rosnosky had nodded decisively her competitor behind her had shaken his head and the cry of sold to mrs rosnosky at thirty came through the air tom looked at dorothy expressively and she nodded back and whispered it looks as if it might be the machine we'll get it from her clearly mrs rosnosky had obtained all she desired motioning to a boy in the rear she stepped to the clerk's desk paid her money and started to remove her goods by the aid of her helper paying no attention to the cries and movement about her we followed the machine as it left the building and stood on the opposite side of the street as the boy and the woman filled an old express cart with their purchases last of all they put in the medley of apparatus on its wooden stand as they placed it on the wagon i lounged across the street want to sell that i asked pointing to the apparatus not for anything you want to pay young man came back the answer to my surprise i'll give you five dollars for it mrs rosnosky vouchsafed no reply to my offer and mounted the seat tom who had heard the conversation came hurrying across what do you want for it he asked five thousand dollars replied mrs rosnosky clucking to her horse tom seized the bridle nonsense woman you got that for nothing and you ask five thousand dollars we're willing to give you a fair price but that's robbery mrs rosnosky looked at us keenly if you really want to talk business she said say so that's worth five thousand dollars she seized a cylinder with a sudden gesture ripping it from its place she pointed to a band of silvery metal round it that's platinum she said there's five thousand dollars in that stuff for me if you want it you take it now or not at all i know what platinum is worth dorothy who had crossed the street and stood beside us broke in take it tom and tom obeyed with a nod he turned to the woman i haven't five thousand or five hundred dollars with me but if you'll come up town i'll get five thousand for you mrs rosnosky would not part with the apparatus tom would not let it out of his sight either tom had to mount the express wagon or mrs rosnosky had to come in the motor car the latter was her choice and mrs rosnosky had the joy of sitting enthroned in a big blue motor while we sped up town the bank had long since been closed and for swiftness and surety we decided to run up to tom's club there he was able to cash a check mrs rosnosky bore the gaze of the few men who lingered around the big club windows with a perfect and patronizing equanimity and her money in hand finally descended from the car and returned to her east side abode a richer woman tom heaved a sigh of relief as we started off again thank heaven that red and gold nightmare with the wig is gone she was a clever one though who'd have thought of her recognizing platinum at a glance i didn't i confess under all that dust poor old dinkle his heart would break if he could see the machine now never mind tom said dorothy as he gazed ruefully at the wreck before him i think we can get that together again but how i wish we had the data in the manuscript End of chapter 6